Breaking news now. We'll take you live to Ottawa, where the head of the Emergency Act Commission is addressing the report's findings. Let's listen live. Set by the statute. Dedication of too many people to name. I'm proud to say that we have carried out the important task assigned to us by Parliament, produced a thorough and comprehensive report, and met the deadline set by statute. On previous occasions, I've said that this Commission's task is first and foremost a tool to be a tool of accountability and to foster public confidence. The invocation of the Emergencies Act was a significant event. Members of the public have a right to know that what the government did and why they did it. The Commission has already contributed to the public's right to know through its public hearings. For over 30 days in October, November and December 2022, the Commission heard from 76 witnesses and 50 experts. Many senior government officials were examined, both by Commission Council and by Council for the 22 parties to whom the Commission granted standing to participate in the hearings. The witnesses who testified included organizers of the convoy, citizens affected by the protests, police, public servants, and elected officials at the municipal and federal levels. Even the Prime Minister testified, providing his own account of the events in question. There was also unprecedented access to documents produced by dozens of different entities, including the federal government. Commission counsel were security cleared and able to review documents that were otherwise classified or protected by national security or other public interest privilege. For only the fourth time in Canadian history, cabinet confidence was waived over records containing the inputs that were before cabinet when it deliberated over the use of the Emergencies Act. Approximately 28,000 documents were disclosed to the parties who participated in the hearings and approximately 9,000 of those were introduced into evidence. Les audiences ont permis au the proceedings became a rare public examination of decision-making by the federal and other governments and government agencies. Thousands of people watched the proceedings, read the transcripts, and examined the exhibits. From these proceedings, the public has already been exposed to an immense amount of information. Individuals have been able to form their own views about the events of early 2022. Today, with the publication of my report, the Commission contributes to public accountability in a second way. By setting out my findings, conclusions and recommendations following the events in question. My report contains over 2,000 pages spread across five volumes. It consists of an executive summary, two volumes of analysis, a detailed record of the Commission's activities, a report summarizing the over 8,800 submissions received in our public consultation process, and a collection of expert policy papers produced for the Commission. In the report, I chronicle the origins of the Freedom Convoy. I conclude that it was not an organization with clear leadership. Rather, it was a movement comprised of people who shared certain social, economic, and political grievances, but also had countless individual views. Many of the protesters' concerns long predated COVID-19 pandemic. They were rooted in feelings of loss of place within Canadian society, alienation, economic anxieties, and loss of faith in government. That said, the pandemic and responding public health measures were an important motivator that caused the Freedom Convoy to mobilize. Some will want my report <clears throat> to make findings or conclusions about COVID itself or the correctness of how government responded to it. Those people may be 
disappointed. My mandate is not about the pandemic or public health policy. Those are important topics, but not ones with which I have been tasked. I do, however, make two observations. First, the COVID-19 pandemic was perhaps a once-in-a-generation crisis. Governments, federal, provincial, municipal, responded in good faith to circumstances as they understood them. Second, however, however one views those responses, they imposed real hardships on thousands of Canadians. <coughs> People did not only lose family and friends to the disease. Some also lost jobs, businesses, homes and savings. Many more, such as healthcare workers, labored under extremely difficult circumstances. Truckers were another group that felt a heavy weight from the pandemic, sometimes made more difficult by health measures put in place by governments. When new rules that limited the ability of unvaccinated truckers to cross the Canada-US border were announced, this served as a rallying point for those who disagreed with government policy. These individuals organized, mobilized, and became what would come to be known as the Freedom Convoy Movement. One of the most cherished rights enjoyed by Canadians is the right to engage in political protest. The ability of individuals and groups to publicly voice their dis dissent enriches and empowers our democracy. It's hardly surprising that government health measures would cause some form of protest in response, given their impact on people's lives. What was surprising was the size and scale of these protests and the way in which they proliferated across the country. The majority of those who participated in the protest were animated by a genuine desire to engage in peaceful demonstrations so that their voices would be heard by leaders in government. They wished to exercise their fundamental right to express their political views, and they had a right to do so. However, like any large group, there were a diversity of views and intentions among the participants of the Freedom Convoy. Amongst the many who intended to protest peacefully were others who had more sinister goals or who were willing to engage in dangerous conduct to achieve their desired ends. For reasons that I discuss in my report, what began as a massive protest evolved into something entirely unpre unprecedented, an occupation of the core of the nation's capital. In January and February 2022, the events of January and February 2022 were not limited to Ottawa. As I describe in my report, protests were occurring across the country in places such as Coutts, Alberta, Emerson, Manitoba, and Windsor, Ontario. These prote protests were also diverse. They ranged from peaceful marches to blockades of critical infrastructure. The size and scope of these protests was truly unprecedented. Police and governments alike struggled to respond. Ultimately, the federal government's response was to declare a public order emergency. Is what role I should play in assessing Cabinet's decision to invoke the Emergencies Act? There's no precedent that helps to answer that question. Some parties have argued that I should not opine on the appropriateness of the, of the decision and uh, whether government met the statutory requirement to declare the public emergency order was not within my mandate. They note quite properly that determining the legality of the government's actions is the role of the courts of law. Others, however, have argued that pronouncing on the decision is the raison d'etre, the, the very reason for this commission. 
In my view, the role and focus of a commission of inquiry into the use of the Emergencies Act will depend, to a certain extent, on the context in which the Act is invoked. In some instances, it may be on doubt that the conditions the, for invoking the Act were met. But there may be other questions that require careful review. In the present situation, however, I'm faced with a statute that has never been used or judicially interpreted. Serious questions have been raised as to whether the legal threshold to use the Act have been met. My assessment of the circumstances surrounding the invocation of the Act, therefore, inevitably involved a consideration of the Act's requirements. While nothing in my report is in any sense binding on the courts that may hear legal challenges to the use of the Act, I have decided to set out my own views on the invocation of the Act and the measures taken under it. After careful reflection, I have concluded that the very high threshold required for the invocation of the Act was met. In particular, for reasons that I discuss in detail in the report, I have concluded that when the decision was made to invoke the Act on February 14, 2022, Cabinet had reasonable grounds to believe that there existed a national emergency arising from threats to the security of Canada that necessitated the taking of special temporary measures. I do not come to this conclusion easily, as I do not consider the factual basis for it to be overwhelming. Reasonable and informed people could reach a different conclusion than the one I have arrived at. After careful reflection, I have concluded that the very high threshold required for the invocation of the Act was met. In particular, for reasons that I discuss in detail in the report, I have concluded that when the decision was made to invoke the Act on February 14, 2022, Cabinet had reasonable grounds to believe that there existed a national emergency arising from threats to the security of Canada that necessitated the taking of special temporary measures. I do not come to this conclusion easily, as I do not consider the factual basis for it to be overwhelming. Reasonable and informed people could reach a different conclusion than the one I've arrived at. I also reached this conclusion reluctantly. The state should generally be able to respond to circumstances of urgency without the use of emergency powers. Okay, so we've been listening to Justice Rouleau, the Emergencies Act Commissioner, uh, revealing his report, reading some of the findings, uh, the headlines, of course, coming out of this at the Public Order Emergency Commission, that the federal government did meet the very high threshold for invoking the Emergencies Act, but Rouleau saying it could have been avoided if it weren't for a series of policing failures. A lot of that was highlighted throughout the commission. And also, all levels of government, he says, failing to rise above politics. So he's saying very reluctant to reach this conclusion. He sounded almost hesitant as he's delivering uh, the conclusion to his report. So fascinating to listen to. There was going to be plenty of reaction coming to this over the afternoon. Of course, uh, Pierre Polyev has said that he will be responding to that, the federal conservative leader, in about an hour's time.